Well, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming out on this Friday evening. Uh, obviously, there are other uh, competing attractions, shall we say, in Manhattan. So I'm pleased to see that you're here with me. And let me also uh, salute uh, Tim and his steady hand at the helm of this important institution. The renovation that you see in this room is emblematic of the renovation that has taken place within one of the most important institutions, in fact, a jewel of the progressive movement, not only in the United States, but of the world. And so I salute Tim for his. <laughs> so, as noted, um, this book talk in many ways is an introduction to this conference tomorrow on communists and the civil rights movement. And so in talking about Paul Robeson's life, I'm going to try to intersect uh, certain vignettes and stories and insights about that wider and broader topic, particularly through talking about some of his friends and comrades, such as William L. Patterson, Ben Davis, Du Bois, uh, et cetera. And let me also say that I sort of stumbled into history some years ago and began writing about the history of communists. But I quickly found that in order to tell, tell an adequate and accurate story about radicalism, black radicalism in particular, I had to do more than write about communists. I had to try to rewrite the history of the United States of America, and more specifically, rewrite the history of slavery, uh, a founding institution of the United States of America. And uh, that's one of the topics I'm going to try to address tomorrow afternoon. You know, we're having a session at 2 o'clock, and I hope that some of you can find the time to come to that, too. In any case, uh, Paul Robeson was born in New Jersey in 1898 and passed away in Philadelphia in 1976. Uh, in between, he was a All-American football player and, and star student at Rutgers University right down the road in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Uh, was a star athlete as well, particularly in terms of US football but also in terms of track and field and basketball and baseball. Uh, he had many very unfortunate incidents on the gridiron that helped to shape his consciousness. That is to say, not only uh, playing for Rutgers in the World War I era, when teams oftentimes would not want to compete against Rutgers because of his presence on the team, that is to say, the fact that he was black, but also uh, certain kinds of rather brutal and vicious encounters in practice <laughs> with his own teammates uh, seeking to inflict uh, bottling harm and mayhem upon him. Uh, obviously, such incidents helped to uh, shape his developing political consciousness. From Rutgers, uh, Paul Robeson migrates to New York City, where he studies law at Columbia University. After graduating from Columbia, he spends some time uh, practicing law, but like many who go through that meat grinder called law school, he quickly and rapidly flees the profession, uh, not least because of the kinds of racist incidents he's subjected to as a lawyer seeking to practice in New York City in the early 1920s. He also spends a bit of time as a professional football player in the nation's uh, National Football League. Now, of course, the National Football League today is a multi-billion dollar business. Uh, even its draft of college athletes, which took place within the last 24 hours, uh, routinely draws uh, thousands, if not millions, of viewers. Uh, but at this particular moment, the National Football League uh, was not as big an enterprise as it has become. In fact, they even have 
of black coaches. It shows you how tiny the enterprise was then, because we hardly have that now. But he migrated from the National Football League and somehow stumbled into being discovered as an artist. Uh, that is to say, he stumbled into acting and singing, somewhat accidentally, somewhat serendipitously. Like many uh, black artists, creative artists before or since, he found that uh, going abroad was a way not only to cultivate his talent, but a way to find more appreciative audiences. I mean, if you think about Josephine Baker, the Chanteuse with roots in the US Midwest and St. Louis who winds up migrating to Paris, actually around the same time, becoming, of course, not only a star in Paris as an artist, but also a leader of the French resistance uh, during World War II, decorated by the French government, and of course, coming back to the United States in the 1950s and encountering a rancid Jim Crow that sends her fleeing back to France. And James Baldwin, Richard Wright, jazz musicians like Dexter Gordon, for example. Uh, it's uh, quite a story to be told, and, and to a degree has been told, about the black artists who particularly found it necessary to go into exile in order to make sure that their artistic talent was sufficiently cultivated. In Paul Robeson's case, of course, it was London. And I wrote this book for a publisher in London. And so the book, as a result, is not necessarily written in the first place with the US audience in mind. And I have to confess <laughs> that Writing for a non-U.S. audience was somewhat liberating because, uh, you know, people in the United States tend to be like fish in water. I mean, they're so immersed in the environment, oftentimes it's difficult to get critical distance on this country and not acknowledge how conservative it is. Believe it or not, I mean, it seems to me painfully obvious, but oftentimes that's not the case, I've noticed with U.S. nationals. And certainly writing for a non-U.S. audience where you don't necessarily have to assume that anti-communism is part of the birthright, for example. I mean, I found that somewhat liberating and not having to necessarily explain in a certain kind of way. And in any case, Robeson always said that if you wanted to understand him, you should try to understand London and his experience there, uh, much more so than trying to understand Moscow, although of course, as we shall see, and as I'm sure you already know, uh, he was quite close to Moscow, and I would not want to denigrate that at all, but I would want to highlight that particular point that comes uh, from his words. That is to say that in London, uh, he was exposed to, as I note in the book, some of the more sophisticated Marxists and political radicals of the 20th century. Um, Maurice Cornforth, uh, Rajani Palm Dutt, Harry Pollitt, uh, people whose words are still worth contemplating and considering in 2016. He also, of course, was in close touch with the British Labor Party, and he always suggested that part of his conception of socialism, which we'll get to the genealogy of his relationship to that shortly, uh, came from his encounters, not only with these Marxists and Marxist-Leninists and communists in London, but also through the British Labor Party. The National Health Service, for example, which of course is a post-World War II institution, but still the seeds of it uh, were planted well before World War II. Uh, it was in London that uh, Robeson also uh, not only helped to hone his acting, in terms of his stellar performance of Othello, remarking the 400th anniversary of the death of William Shakespeare, and Robeson helped to bring uh, Sheen to that particular play, Othello. But it was also in London that uh, Robeson acted in a number of other plays as well, uh, particularly uh, a play on the Haitian Revolution in which he collaborated with uh, 
the Trinidadian intellectual uh, C.L.R. James. And perhaps if someone asks about that, that'll give me an opportunity to talk about my book on the Haitian Revolution. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> okay. And it's, it's interesting when you consider Robeson and, and Art that uh, being a man who was sensitive to social science, he recognized that in terms of creativity and art, there's oftentimes a relationship between the capital investment in the particular art and one's ability to be progressive. That is to say that if one is a poet with a pencil and pad, one can be exceedingly radical, even if one has to go to a publisher in order for your poetry to see the light of day, whereas if you're working in a Hollywood production with uh, millions of dollars of capital investment and scores of workers involved, it's much more difficult and problematic to be progressive, which is one of the reasons why Robeson ultimately deserted the silver screen. That is to say, deserted movies, because uh, even today, uh, many of his cinematic performances uh, are not necessarily the zenith of his artistic creativity. In fact, uh, a number of his movies, he tried to buy up all the prints, and so they would <laughs> never see the light of day. I'm thinking of Sanders of the River in particular, although uh, you may recall that the film that he made in Wales, the Proud Valley, uh, about Welsh miners, which in fact featured Welsh miners as actors, uh, he considered to be the apex of his cinematic career. And I would recommend that film in 2016. But in any case, a turning point for Robeson comes in the early 1930s when he comes face to face with a rising fascism in Germany. And I mean that in a sense quite literally because he had a confrontation at a train station uh, in Germany uh, with some jackbooted uh, officers, uh, Nazi party members, no doubt, and uh, barely escaped uh, intact. Uh, he was en route to Moscow, which was his next stop after Germany. Recall that, as I'm sure this audience knows more than most, in 1917 you had the Russian Revolution, uh, you had the coming to power of the Communist Party in what came to be known as the Soviet Union. Uh, Robeson was headed there, and there he makes a reacquaintance with an old friend from Harlem. I'm speaking of William L. Patterson. Uh, William L. Patterson was born in the early 1890s in San Francisco, of partially Caribbean and partially uh, mainland African slave descent. He matriculates at the University of California, graduates from law school at the University of California. Uh, for various reasons, had considered uh, trying to move abroad as well to escape the pernicious Jim Crow that was the lot of black people generally in North America. But for various reasons that I detail in my biography of Patterson, he winds up uh, joining the Communist Party and being trained in Moscow, uh, speaks some Russian as a partial result, uh, is the leader of a campaign that was a turning point in terms of the decades-long struggle against Jim Crow. I'm speaking of the Scottsboro case, the case of the Scottsboro Nine, the nine black youth in Dixie, who are falsely accused of sexual molestation of two Euro-American women, or and like many black young men before and since, were on the fast track to being executed when you have the militant intervention of the International Labor Defense, of which Patterson was a leading officer uh, after their arrest and detention in 1931. This was a turning point in terms of the struggle against Jim Crow, 
uh, it is a necessary prelude to the erosion of Jim Crow in the 1950s, as marked by Brown versus Board of Education, May 17, 1954, or Montgomery Bus Boycott, or Rosa Parks, and Martin Luther King, circa 55, 56. It's a necessary prelude uh, to those perhaps better known events because the Scottsboro case internationalized the question of Jim Crow. Jim Crow became an international cause celebre, not unlike apartheid in South Africa in the 1970s and 1980s. And my argument is, and has been, that it required international pressure to crack the spine of Jim Crow, uh, not least because of the rather disadvantageous correlation of forces that existed domestically, and I also have made the argument in my books on slavery that it took international pressure as well to break the back of slavery in the United States, not least pressure from Haitian revolutionaries and British abolitionists. In any case, it's this encounter with Patterson in Moscow that helps to convince Robeson to make a deeper engagement with the socialist project then unfolding and to make a deeper avowal, if you like, to the uh, tenets of Marxism. Subsequently, of course, <laughs> their critics suggested that Patterson was a kind of Svengali, who, a sort of Pied Piper who was leading astray Robeson and, and many others. But obviously, that's a, a bridge too far, to put it mildly. Uh, Robeson was already on that track. And I, was, I would say that the Patterson's intervention was uh, a sufficient condition for his moving further to the left and making deeper commitments and engagements. It was sufficient. But uh, even without Patterson, I think that this same process would have unfolded. But of course, this is counterfactual. In any case, uh, it was in Moscow that Patterson, excuse me, that Robeson also, of course, encountered Sergei Eisenstein, the great uh, Soviet filmmaker. They made certain plans, and sadly, that did not come into fruition about uh, making different films, including films about the Haitian Revolution. Uh, it's also that after the journey to Moscow that you found Robeson on the front lines in Spain. Recall that circa 1936, you have the unfolding of the Spanish Civil War, in some ways a prelude to the eruption of World War II in Europe in 1939, when you have the fascist forces spearheaded by Berlin and Rome in the first place, who are helping to support an internal revolt in Spain led by Francisco Franco. Uh, as you know, the Spanish Civil War becomes an international cause for the left. I've noticed in the Amsterdam News, the local black paper for the past couple of weeks, they had features on black Americans who were involved in the Spanish Civil War. Just yesterday, of course, the feature was on Oliver Law. Uh, last week it was on Solaria Key, the black woman played a role as a nurse for Spanish forces. It was in Spain that you saw many uh, black Americans for the first time uh, lead integrated, racially integrated troops into battle. Robeson contributed his immense talent to the Spanish Republican forces, to the Spanish progressive forces, uh, not only in terms of his singing on the front lines at uh, possible cost to his a personal safety and well-being because single and front line is not an easy exercise, to put it mildly, uh, but also in terms of raising money uh, after returning to London, uh, where his home was sighted. You should also know that it was in London in the 1930s that uh, Robeson made the acquaintance of many uh, African leaders who were to come into prominence in subsequent de decades, speaking of, for example, uh, Jomo Kenyatta in the first place, the founding father of modern Kenya, who, you may be surprised to know, uh, started out 
as a person on the left, but for various reasons, decided not to stay there. But in any case, that association with Robeson was oftentimes subsequently used to try to discredit Joma Kenyatta after he became the founding leader of an independent Kenya in December 1963. Uh, Robeson oftentimes suggested that it was in London that he, quote, discovered, unquote, Africa. That is to say, his association with these anti-colonial leaders uh, like Joma Kenyatta, his association with the West African Student Union, uh, for example, in London. And it was there that the idea emerged of the initiation of the Council on African Affairs. Uh, you may recall that it was the Council on African Affairs which was eventually headquartered in New York City uh, that was the leading and preeminent organization in the United States spearheading the struggle against colonialism in Africa. In fact, you may note that I start the book, Paul Robeson, The Artist is Revolutionary, with a vignette from Johannesburg in 1952 when Nelson Mandela's African National Congress is marching through the streets to the sound and the tune of some of Paul Robeson's songs. Uh, it's very striking that the African National Congress, which was under siege in the 1950s, found the time and opportunity to campaign and protest against the persecution of Paul Robeson in the United States of America. It's that kind of uh, mutuality, this mutual solidarity, that is to say, the council and Robeson campaigning against apartheid and the folks in South Africa campaigning in favor of Robeson's getting his passport returned after it had been seized, is the kind of internationalism and the kind of mutuality uh, that I dare say uh, this movement in the United States could take a dose of as we speak. In any case, uh, Robeson might have stayed in London uh, to his dying days, but World War II intervenes. Recall that it was in 1939 that the guns of war erupt in Europe. Robeson was concerned that he and his family would be trapped behind the lines of war and that the better part of wisdom would be to return to the United States, which he does shortly thereafter. Returning to the United States, of course, Robeson plunges into a maelstrom of political activity. Uh, one of the signal aspects of Robeson's life was his solidarity with uh, US-based trade unions. I should not, not just say US-based trade unions, trade unions generally, because of course, as already noted, he was a stalwart supporter of Welsh miners. But on this side of the Atlantic, uh, his activism included solidarity with the National Maritime Union, which you may recall had been organized in the 1930s, the number two leader of the NMU, the Organization of Seafarers was a man of Jamaican descent, Ferdinand Smith, a leader of the NMU, a leader of the Communist Party. Uh, Robeson was quite close to uh, Ferdinand Smith and to the NMU. Uh, the same could be said for the West Coast Longshore workers, the stevedores, the dockers, under the leadership of Harry Bridges, well-born in Melbourne, Australia, who, of course, leads the general strike in San Francisco in 1934, which sets the stage for the organizing of West Coast Longshore. You may know about my um, book on Hawaii, uh, Fighting in Paradise, Labor Unions, Communists, and something else in the making of modern Hawaii, uh, where uh, Harry Bridges and that union plays a key role in helping to convert what had been a backwater of Dixie-style provincialism and reactionary politics in the 1930s to what is now the bluest of the blue states, as they say, in the United States. So the state in the United States that is the closest companion 
to the kind of social democracy that is deemed to be routine, at least in Vancouver. I was about to say Scandinavia, but they're on the retreat there. But in any case, that was largely a product of the activism of this Robeson-supported union, the ILWU, led by Harry Bridges. Uh, when World War II erupts on this side of the Pacific, that is to say with the bombing of Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, and the entry of the United States into World War II on the side of the Allies, that is to say London, ultimately Moscow, Robeson throws himself headlong into support for the anti-fascist cause. Uh, now, to some of you, this may seem as if a, it was a no-brainer, as they say in the United States. That is to say, of course, he would throw himself into the anti-fascist cause. But keep in mind that it was not preordained that black Americans in particular would be supportive of the US war effort. Recall all the previous episodes, not least World War I, a few decades earlier, where black Americans were told that if you make this blood sacrifice uh, for the war and the US military, then the milk and honey of civil rights will flow upon your return to these shores. Uh, you will have made the world safe for democracy, for example. And so there was quite a bit of skepticism, shall we say, reluctance, shall we say, with regard to black Americans generally uh, as World War II was erupting. And the other factor, which will be the subject of uh, the next book I publish next year, actually, with NYU Press, is the fact that in the years leading up to World War II, uh, Tokyo had made a concerted effort to carry favor with black Americans. That's something I'll talk about a bit more tomorrow afternoon. And uh, it had borne fruit to a certain degree. Uh, you may recall the scene from the autobiography of Malcolm X, for example, where he goes to the draft board and suggests that, yeah, draft me, because you put a rifle in my hand, I'm going to turn around and shoot my officers, because that's what I'm here for. And you may recall that Elijah Muhammad, the patron saint of the Nation of Islam, along with many others, was arrested, detained, because of reluctance to fight during World War II. And it all stems out of this pro-Tokyo sentiment. So Robeson had quite a task on his hands to convince some that it was worth making yet another blood sacrifice for this anti-fascist cause, but of course the reasoning being that if you could push back successfully against the ultra-right with regard to this war, that would create favorable conditions <coughs> for pushing back against the ultra-right domestically. The double V, as used to be said, victory against fascism at home and against racism, excuse me, fascism abroad and racism at home, I guess I could say fascism at home and abroad, actually. Um, this is also exemplified by the election to the New York City Council in 1943 of one of Robeson's good friends, Ben Davis, the Atlanta-born lawyer, uh, the product of one of the more affluent families in Atlanta, Georgia. His father was a leader of the Republican Party in Atlanta. That, that, of course, was a time before the New Deal transition to voting for the Democratic Party in mass, where it seems that black American voters, for the most part, are still cited. Uh, Davis matriculates at Amherst College and Harvard Law School. Like Patterson and Robeson, seems to be on the fast track to fame and fortune. Uh, when the Angelo Herndon case emerges in Georgia, sort of a companion case to the Scottsboro Nine, in terms of being an international cause to live about this black American who is being railroaded into prison. Patterson goes, excuse me, <laughs> Davis goes from there into the ranks of the Communist Party, eventually moving to New York, writing for the Daily Worker, and of course being their candidate for the city council, uh, cited in Harlem in 1943, 
reelected before being ousted unceremoniously in 1949, perhaps illegally, and then subjected to prosecution by the federal authorities and eventually winding up in federal prison in Indiana, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Uh, the solidarity between Robeson and Patterson was one of the more, Robeson and Davis was one of the more significant aspects of Robeson's life. In fact, he used to say that in terms of acting Othello, the way as an actor, he would prepare himself psychologically for acting out these scenes of, of betrayal that the character has to endure in that particular performance is imagining that his good friend, Ben Davis, would betray him. And that was how he worked himself up psychologically in order to uh, act out Othello. But that particular election of Davis was emblematic of the fact that there was something to this idea that if you put the ultra-right back on their heels during World War II, it could lead to a certain kind of democratic advance and the setting back on their heels of the ultra-right at home as well. But in any case, with the ending of World War II, as you know, there was a transition in terms of the foreign policy of the United States of America. That is to say, the end of World War II is quickly followed by the eruption of the Red Scare in the Cold War. And the former ally in Moscow becomes public enemy number one. It's very curious about the United States with regard to uh, Moscow. And I should say parenthetically, I find it quite striking that in 2016, relations between Washington and Moscow are far from ideal, to put it mildly, uh, which is quite curious because we were led to believe that if you got rid of those big bad communists in Moscow, then everything would be hunky-dory, so to speak, which suggests that the fact that that did not happen perhaps indicate that there was something else involved even in the preceding period, the Cold War, that has yet to be sufficiently articulated. In any case, what's curious about this Washington-Moscow kerfuffle is that in the United States, the line is, is that it was OK to be pro-Moscow between June 22, 1941 and September 1, 1945. That is to say, from the time of Hitler's invasion to the time of the ceremony on the battleship Missouri, where the Japanese militarists finally surrendered but not before June 22nd, 1941, and not after September 1st, 1945, as exemplified by the movies. Uh, in this book I wrote on Hollywood, Class Struggle in Hollywood, I talked about Mission to Moscow, which some of you might have seen. Uh, it was made at the behest of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, who felt that the steady diet of anti-communism that had been fed to the U.S. public did not predispose the United States public to exemplify and exude the kind of solidarity with Moscow that was needed to subjugate the Nazis and the fascists in particular. Uh, if you see this film, and I highly recommend it, even though it, it really doesn't work as a movie, but it's interesting, uh, you, you, you'll find that uh, Joseph Stalin is, is portrayed as this benevolent leader, much beloved by his people. They have a particular view of the so-called Moscow trials of the 1930s that does not dovetail with the contemporary analysis uh, of those trials that is held by most. In fact, one of the things I've noticed about the United States is that the only individuals who I've found who take a line contrary to solidarity with Moscow between 1941 and 1945, or the late <coughs> US President Herbert Hoover, and the contemporary <coughs> political analyst Patrick J. Buchanan. They are consistent, that is to say, anti-Moscow before June 41, <coughs> during <laughs> World War II, and after September 1st. Everyone else, you know, they're somewhat inconsistent. 
But in any case, uh, Robeson's point of view was that the kind of friendship that was exemplified during World War II should be carried over in the post-World War II era. And that just as Washington found it necessary to ally with Moscow to subjugate its antagonists, that folks here in the United States who were combating an ultra-right <coughs> foe also uh, should have the right to engage in solidarity with Moscow to subdue their antagonists. But to put it mildly, that was not a point of view that was widely shared uh, in the United States of America. A turning point for Robeson comes in 1946 when he has this face-to-face -face confrontation with U.S. President Harry S. Truman, the former haberdasher from Kansas City, rumored to have been associated with the Ku Klux Klan uh, during its heyday, and in one of the most disastrous personnel moves in the history of the United States, if not the history of the world, uh, Henry A. Wallace was dislodged as vice president at the Democratic Party convention in the summer of 1944 and replaced by Harry Truman. Franklin Delano Roosevelt dies in April 1945. Truman ascends to the highest office in the land and it's there in 1946 that he and Robeson are going at it. According to an account of one who was there, uh, Truman's face was turning purple as the blood rushed to his temples. From the tongue lashing he was receiving uh, from Robeson because of the lethargy and the lassitude of the US authorities in prosecuting lynchers, oftentimes mutilating black soldiers freshly home from the war in their military uniforms. It was that incident that in many ways marks the turning point in Robeson's story career. That is to say that from that point forward, you saw a relentless persecution of Paul Robeson. I noticed today in the New York Times there's a review of this installation at the Whitney Museum curated by Steve McQueen, who of course directed um, Hunger? Was it Hunger? Hunger, but I'm the slavery. Twelve years of slavery. Hey. Twelve years of slavery. Um, and of course, this next feature will be Robeson. And apparently, I haven't seen, did anybody see the installation? No. Just no. opened. Yeah, just opened. Uh, but apparently, it, it focuses on this Red Scare period and the FBI's uh, relentless persecution and pursuit of Paul Robeson. In any case, um, Robeson, after World War II and the onset of the Red Scare and the Cold War, is subjected to relentless uh, fly specking, that is to say surveillance, uh, of one of the most watched men on this side of the Atlantic, to be sure. Uh, you may recall that another turning point for Robeson comes in August, September 1949, when in Peak School, New York, he seeks to perform at a fundraising concert on behalf of the Civil Rights Congress, then led by his old friend, William L. Patterson, and barely escapes intact physically because of the howling mobs who are calling for his scalp, the howling racist and anti-Semitic mobs, I should say, Apparently, the authorities, uh, like uh, a matador, uh, stepped aside and let the charging bull of this mob uh, unleashed tirades and rocks and bottles on those assembled. Robeson barely escapes. Sir, shortly after that, you may recall that his passport is taken. But even before peak skill, and the passport being snatched, there's another important incident that helps to shed light on the relentlessness with which the authorities pursued Paul Robeson. And that was a speech that he gave at a peace gathering in Paris in the spring of 1949, where his remarks were interpreted as suggesting that black Americans should not join the war hoop against Moscow. Now, this was a very sensitive issue because, as I've tried to suggest in my studies on slavery, uh, lurking beneath the subconsciousness of the U.S. ruling elite historically uh, 
was this idea that foreign invasion would be accompanied by Negro insurrection. And not only that, but uh, the Negroes would not necessarily be enthusiastic about joining the U.S. authorities and their imperialist ventures abroad, uh, which were thought to be necessary to the help of U.S. imperialism. Uh, so when Robeson made remarks that seemed to suggest that he was calling into question whether or not black Americans should be joining into this latest crusade, that is to say the crusade against socialism, the crusade against Moscow, the dogs were unleashed against him. Not only was his passport taken, and not only were howling mobs uh, unleashed against him at Peekskill, but there were a number of attempts to quite frankly assassinate him, including a tampering with his vehicle as he was in St. Louis on his way to Jefferson City, the capital. And it turns out that an eagle eye was able to detect before they set out on the road that the lugs on the tires had been loosened and if they had driven a short distance, perhaps they would have been derailed and leading to the assassination of Paul Robeson. Uh, but unbowed, uh, Robeson chose not to <coughs> cut his views to fit contemporary fashions. Uh, it was in 1950-51 that once again he joined with Patterson uh, in an effort by the Civil Rights Congress, led by Patterson, to file a petition at the United Nations charging the U.S. authorities with genocide against black people. Uh, like Scottsboro, this too was a milestone in the decades-long effort to push back against Jim Crow. That is to say that the upshot of the genocide petition was, quite frankly, to drag the U.S. leaders into the dock, just like certain leaders have been driven into the dock in Nuremberg a few years earlier. Needless to say, this did not go down very well with the U.S. authorities. Uh, nevertheless, you should know that the genocide petition uh, and the cover of the petition uh, features the finger of Paul Robeson pointing the finger of accusation at the U.S. authorities because of their transgressions against black Americans in particular. That this genocide petition was translated into numerous languages, that it was selling the thousands of copies, including here in the United States of America during the height of the post-Korean War hysteria against communists, with the idea being, why should the United States be fighting communists in the Korean Peninsula and letting them, quote, run amok here in North America? But you should know that this genocide petition also sets the stage for the agonizing retreat of the more egregious aspects of Jim Crow. That is to say, uh, how could Washington purport to be the paragon of human rights virtue in this battle of ideas with Moscow when black people and people of color were treated so atrociously on these shores? <coughs> As the State Department put it in its brief in the epical aforementioned Brown versus Board of Education decision, May 17, 1954, it would facilitate a more successful execution of U.S. foreign policy if the more egregious aspects of Jim Crow were removed. How could Washington credibly make an appeal to the rising African leaders and the rising Caribbean leaders, like Kwame Nkrumah, who, by the way, matriculated at Lincoln University in Pennsylvania, the first leader of independent Ghana in 1957, how could an appeal be made to the likes of Kwame Nkrumah when Ghanaian diplomats coming to Washington oftentimes had to face a Jim Crow? In fact, uh, in my book on Kenya, I noted that Barack Obama Sr. Uh, was in many ways the fruits of this process because there was this concerted effort to try to bring African students here to convince them that the United States was not as bad as it seemed in the genocide petition. And it's interesting to note 
that the State Department was so concerned that these African diplomats and African students would be subjected to the Jim Crow that was the inevitable fate of black Americans, that they had suggested one time that the Africans be given a badge to wear to show that they weren't black Americans, so they could enter restaurants, go on buses, and generally escape these horrible and atrocious aspects of Jim Crow. So I think that in terms, to step back for a second, in terms of this conference that's taking place this weekend, uh, one of the signal aspects of the role of communism in the civil rights movement, uh, irrespective of what goes on in the late 50s, the 60s, and going forward, is this genocide petition of the Civil Rights Congress. And as is well known, uh, no good deed goes unpunished, and it's not long thereafter that uh, William Patterson <laughs> is imprisoned. The Civil Rights Congress is driven by the US government into liquidation uh, circa 1956. At that time, Robeson, too, was suffering to a degree because his income had plummeted from the six figures, which would be about a million dollars in contemporary terms annually, to the low four figures. Uh, and with a, a precipitous drop in income comes a necessary circumscribing of his uh, lifestyle as well. And once again, Robeson was undeterred and unbowed and was able, during that very horrific period, to still inflict blows beyond those inflicted by the Civil Rights Congress petition. For example, this initiation of the newspaper Freedom, which is a precursor to Freedom Ways, whose exhibit you see over there. And Freedom was this Harlem-based newspaper that attracts stellar talent, such as Lorraine Hansberry, who you may recall goes on to fame and fortune as the author of Raisin in the Sun, dies prematurely and tragically in 1965 at the age of 34. Alice Childress, uh, Harry Belafonte, and Sidney Poitier uh, talk about their debt to Paul Robeson in terms of blazing a trail in Hollywood, but also in terms of the counsel that he provided them, uh, that both Belafonte and Poitier talk about at some length in their respective memoirs and autobiographies. In any case, because of international pressure by the late 1950s, the US authorities are compelled to return Paul Robeson's passport. And he immediately decamps to London and goes on a whirlwind tour. Uh, probably he overdoes it to a degree. He's like a famished man confronted with a banquet. He travels to Australia and New Zealand, for example, and engages in acts of solidarity with the indigenous, so-called aboriginal population of Australia, the Maori population of New Zealand. But uh, this puts quite a strain on his health, which was already deteriorating. I should also mention in this context that the same holds true for his companion, spouse, comrade, erstwhile business manager, Eslanda Robeson, uh, who passes away tragically in 1965. At that point, Robeson's health uh, is deteriorating ever more sharply. He returns to the United excuse me, he returns to the United States and moves into a working class community in Philadelphia with his sister and is in virtual seclusion as far as the public is concerned. And there he lives his remaining days until passing away in January 1976. Now, just to wrap up, I think that the lessons of Paul Robeson's life are various. But in terms of the pressures of the clock, I'll just mention a few. Uh, one is struggle. Uh, as already suggested throughout my remarks, uh, Paul Robeson was a struggler. Uh, he was quite close to communist parties, both in Britain and the United States. He was quite close to trade unions, particularly the National Maritime Union and the ILWU. He helped to found the Council on African Affairs, the preeminent organization seeking to spearhead the struggle against decolonization of Africa. He raised money 
tirelessly for the Civil Rights Congress, led by his friend William L. Patterson. Secondly, I would say study. Paul Robeson was a lifetime student. He studied languages maniacally and as a virtual habit. Uh, he spoke Russian fluently, as you probably know, read Marx and German, blended <coughs> Russian. Spoke Spanish, which was obviously very important here in the United States of America. French, very important in Canada. Studied African languages. Once J. Edgar Hoover, uh, the head of the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Federal Police, was able to purloin a copy of one of Robeson's notebooks with scribblings in Chinese, the Chinese script. And he, of course, uh, the FBI thought that this was some sort of secret message from Mao Zedong. Uh, but actually, Robeson was working out complex questions of grammar and syntax in, in Chinese. Robeson, of course, studied literature as befits a creative artist, uh, studied acting and the dynamics of acting, because as I'm sure you know, acting is not just going on stage and gesticulating. You know, it's, it's a, a career and a profession that involves study, uh, political economy. But Robeson was also an internationalist. Uh, I think that ties into the above mentioned traits. Uh, that is to say that I think that his study of languages was an emblem of the fact that he thought humanity was one, proceeding, albeit at differing speeds, toward the ultimate goal of a socialist commonwealth, and that his study of languages would help to facilitate that process in the sense that uh, he was always talking about how some African language bore this uncanny resemblance to Gaelic, or, or so how some how uh, Arabic bears this uncanny resemblance to Chinese, uh, for example, always trying to show the, the oneness of humanity. But also, as a performing artist, uh, he recognized that it, it really taps into the emotions of an audience if you can speak to them in their tongue, and if you can sing to them in their tongue. Uh, I tell the story about how Robeson, in the morning, begins to study one day Norwegian, and by the, after, by the evening, it's writing Norwegian. And it's a prelude to going to Norway to sing in Norwegian. So Robeson was a spectacular individual. Uh, the tallest tree in our forest was the term that was oftentimes a pin on him. And that's no exaggeration. That's no hyperbole. And certainly, I think that in many ways, he is an exemplar of what this conference this weekend is all about and also an exemplar of what we need going forward in the 21st century, that is to say, study, struggle, and internationalism. Thank you very much. So, any comments or questions? Yes, sir. Hi. Um, I want to do a, um, a special on Paul Robeson where he's comparing um, the lineage of European music down from African music. And he goes into the notes, like he starts out maybe Egyptian. I don't remember. And I've been looking for that ever since. Can you tell me the name of that? And, uh, the name of the lecture? Yeah, the lecture and where I can find it. Well, you know, can you explain it to it's, probably, it's probably in the Paul Robeson papers at Howard University. Uh, as you probably know, well, it was the actual documentary he showed. Him right, the right. The transcript is what I'm yeah. saying. Uh, it, it, it's probably from one of his BBC interviews. Yeah. The transcripts of which can be found at Howard University. I'm not sure if the actual footage can be found at Howard University, but certainly, <coughs> if I am correct in assuming this is from the BBC, the BBC also has archives as well. Audio, uh, audio, visual, and print transcripts. It's right outside of London, so it can probably be found there. But what you're talking about is this, this example, as I was making reference to in my remarks. <coughs> Robeson was always trying to show the unity of humanity, uh, by making these connections that escape mere mortals. <laughs> that is to say, the, the similarities between certain African. Music in Africa, music in the British Isles, etc. Well, he, he thought that 
East African related languages had a connection to Chinese. I saw that too. And then you see some of the, um, the headdress that the East Africans have. And you can see there's some visual things going on, plus the pottery all along the coast. Yeah. Well, actually, when you mentioned that, it reminds me of something else, which is that uh, in the South Seas, in um, Fiji, for example, the home of people we refer to as Melanesian and Polynesian. It's very interesting that the words in their indigenous languages oftentimes mirror the words in the indigenous languages of East Africa, which has led certain ethno-linguists to conclude and suggest that, well, I was about to say a migration time immemorial from East Africa to the South Seas, although presumably I guess it could have come the other way. But no, it's most likely to go from East Africa to the South Seas, which suggests that uh, you know, Robeson trying to make these connections was, he was not exaggerating. I mean, he was, he was uh, on point. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, you brought up something I about his uh, constantly trying to uh, give up the peak skills. Yes. Yeah, it was, uh, I think, uh, that happened to grow the underworld from Harley. Remember the numbers banker Bumpy Johnson? Mm -hmm. I heard they was going to make a trip up there and take care of business. So, a ball broke some of that had happened mm -hmm. back then. That's when you had like a real unity with the uh, even with the black underworld with the community at that time. I don't know about now, but back then you did. <coughs> you know, Johnson and some of the crew were about to go up there and yeah, to you know, you know handle to handle the ball. You know, I think I mentioned that in my Ben Davis biography, I and mean, it came out many years ago, so I can't recall. I, I, I do think I mentioned in that biography that uh, Davis and Bumpy Johnson used to play chess all the time. Robeson also was a chess player uh, as well, I should say. Surprise. <laughs> yes. Let's talk about the relationship to the speaking between the contemporary civil rights movement of 65 and 75 mm -hmm. and the uh, civil rights and black, black immigration part of the struggle at this point. Mm -hmm. Well, keep in mind the dates that you mentioned marks the time when his health had deteriorated and he had gone into virtual seclusion. But as I've mentioned in the book, uh, many of these leaders saluted Robeson, perhaps at significant personal cost, because saluting a man in 1965 who was thought to be a communist uh, could be rendering one radioactive. And I'm speaking of, for example, James Foreman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, the shock troops of the movement. I'm speaking of Coretta Scott King, the widow of Martin Luther King. Of course, King assassinated April 4th, 1968. I'm speaking of Andrew Young, who I think I quote in the book as talking about the influence of Paul Robeson on him growing up. Uh, Andrew Young, you may recall, who is still in the land of the living, uh, was a top aide to King, uh, goes on to be elected to Congress from Georgia, mayor of Atlanta, then U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations under Jimmy Carter, 1976 to 1980, and then since that point, a kind of international networker of, of, of some note. So I think it's important to point out that the black community, as evidenced by its politics today, was not as steeped in anti-communism as the US society as a whole. Uh, this is in part represented by a picture in the book of George Crockett. You may recall George Crockett as a leading member of the Congressional Black Caucus from Detroit. But in the story I tell, in 1949, he's the lawyer for Ben Davis in the epical Communist Party trial that puts the leadership behind bars for the most part. And Crockett, because of his vigorous advocacy on behalf of his clients, is eventually jailed himself. Uh, you may recall also that uh, Robeson was quite close to Coleman Young, who goes on to become mayor of Detroit. Uh, in fact, to, to try to drag out this connection, uh, like many, I have thought that Haiti has been punished severely over the centuries because of its temerity to rebel against enslavement and establish the 
not only the first independent black republic, but then to engage in acts of solidarity with the enslaved, not least in Dixie, uh, which helps to incur the wrath of the United States of America and leading to a perpetual enslave, excuse me, a perpetual uh, persecution of the island of freedom. Uh, of course, uh, Pat Robertson, your fellow US national and the televangelist, uh, put it another way. <laughs> that is to say, <laughs> suggesting that uh, in rebelling against, against slavery, Haiti, Haiti made a pact with the devil. Oh, matter of fact, did you hear that? Excuse the digression, but I'll get back to the point. Uh, that uh, <laughs> John Boehner, yes. the <laughs> former speaker, called uh, Ted Cruz uh, Lucifer. Lucifer in the flesh. <laughs> the headline in The Hill, the Capitol News. Capitol Hill newspaper today is that the Satanists are objecting. They're thinking about dragging Boehner into court for this defam defamation of their movement. So how dare the speaker compare us to Ted Cruz? But in any case, uh, Detroit, in some ways, has been punished, uh, has been driven down because of its temerity in having a citadel of black militancy, a citadel of labor activism, as exemplified by Ford Local 600, uh, which is, of course, the workers in the centerpiece of the Ford Motor em Empire and Enterprise. And uh, I've oftentimes tried to draw that parallel between uh, Haiti and, and Detroit. But in any case, you are correct to suggest that the, many of the leaders and the uh, followers of the civil rights movement uh, have an enormous amount of respect for Paul Robeson because of the sacrifices that he made. And in fact, on the first page of this book, I suggest that you really can't begin to understand the rise of even figures like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King unless you understand the rise and, if you like, fall of Paul Robeson, the kind of ideological vacuum that that created, a kind of vacuum that you see in many other countries as well, with immense political consequences. Uh, sir, since you just mentioned Henry Ford, he was very, he was a very infamous anti-Semite. Mm -hmm. Did uh, Robeson ever call out Henry Ford on his anti, on his anti-Semitism? I can't recall him calling out Henry Ford, but certainly anti-Semitism as well. I mean, there are a number of references in this text to Robeson, the Jewish community, Robeson and anti-Semitism. Uh, Not Ford. I can't remember any, any references to Ford. The, the, the PBS documentary on Henry Ford is, is quite useful in that regard, uh, in terms of detailing not only Henry Ford's uh, anti-Jewish fervor, uh, but also his ties to the underworld through Harry Bennett, who was the director of security uh, for Ford. I mean, th this whole story of how big business has allied with organized crime in order to break unions is a story that has been told before, but I think is probably due for a fresh re-examination. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that um, uh, the United States uh, going into World War II. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a lecture recently from my professor. Could you speak up a little bit? Yeah, I attended I, I, um, a lecture recently from um, a law professor. His name is um, Aziz Rana. Mm -hmm. His name is what? Uh, Aziz Rana, Cornell Law School okay. professor. Mm -hmm. He talked about how both, I think, Robeson and um, W.B. Du Bois actually uh, uh, struggled against uh, what was happening in the United States then, as, as now, this connection between immigration policy and, and uh, security. And, and what they anticipated was what happened ultimately, which was the Japanese were, were ultimately in, in terror as a result of you know, this idea that uh, uh, we have to you know, protect uh, the United States from sort of, you know, the, the, the immigrants who were um, you know, associated with, with the um, with, the, with those who are fighting against. So I just wondered if you 
Are you aware of that? I'm, I'm aware of that. I, I have to say that you know, the, the, the space in my brain mm -hmm. wants to respond to your comment and question is now being occupied by this next book I have coming out. So <laughs> it's hard for me to get around. And so let me just mention that. So that's, I can't, it's a roadblock I can't get around. It. And that is that it's very interesting to look at the black American response to the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. In some ways, there's a split. On the one hand, you, well, actually, there's probably a three way split. On the one hand, you have uh, folks who are pro Tokyo, like the precursors of the Nation of Islam, for example. On the other hand, you have business elements. I'm doing this book on the Associated Negro Press, led by Claude Burnett, who was a leading black entrepreneur out of Chicago. He saw this as an opportunity. That is to say that as the population of Japanese origin are being swept into internment camps in the region stretching from Seattle to San Diego, he saw this as an opportunity for black Americans to come in and take their place. Um, and in fact, in the sense that does happen, like in Los Angeles, Little Tokyo becomes Bronzeville uh, after uh, January 1942, and that happens in the area 1,500 miles stretching from Seattle to uh, San Diego. And then on the other hand, of course, you have uh, people who are outraged and see this as a precursor <laughs> to uh, what could happen uh, to black Americans at times of stress. Uh, those of us who are familiar with US history know that there is this persistent strain in the history of the trajectory of settler colonialism in the United States of, of trying to get rid of the population of African descent. In fact, if you look at what's called abolitionism, I mean, for example, you oftentimes hear that uh, Vermont abolished slavery circa 1774. But actually, what was this is also relevant to this Pulitzer Prize winning play that's taking New York by storm, apparently, and <laughs> about to take the nation by storm, speaking of Hamilton. I mean, there, there's sort of a, a faux abolitionism. That is to say, if the idea is that slavery is the problem and the Negroes are slaves, then you get rid of all the Negroes. And then that's called abolitionism, <laughs> you see. And certainly after Gable's Revolt, circa 1800 in Virginia, uh, which was directly inspired by the Haitian Revolution, uh, there's this idea that it's very dangerous to have all these Negroes in our midst, and that somehow they should be gotten rid of. Uh, I talk in my Haitian Revolution book about the fact that after the conclusion of the US Civil War, that uh, circa 1870, US President US Grant has the idea of annexing the eastern side of Hispaniola, the Dominican Republic, as a prelude to annexing the entire island, including Haiti, and then deporting in mass the newly freed, enslaved population of African descent from the US mainland. So those, it seems to me, who argued that the internment of Japanese Americans was a very dangerous precedent, I think got the best of the argument. And likewise, as I'm sure you know, uh, we still have to be alert uh, to such diabolical plans in light of some of the inflamed rhetoric that is emerging from some of the leading presidential candidates as we speak. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am thinks you made a great talk. Um, in your research, did you go to London? OK, then I've got two questions. How close was Roe? You know, the British Party is really very active in the arts. And also, their intellectuals actually went to Spain. Mm -hmm. They fought and died there, unlike some of the other intellectuals. <laughs> Who wouldn't go? <laughs> now. Was Robeson the only star who went to Spain and went to the front lines? Because you had writers who went and mm -hmm. journalists. Mm -hmm. But he was a star in those years. Mm -hmm. He was a singer and an actor. Did anyone else of his stature go? And was that the impulse coming from the British party? Mm -hmm. 
Well, sir, may everybody hear the question? Yes. 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 Yeah. No? Yes? Well, there's a question about Robeson in Spain and who and else? And the British party. And the British party. <laughs> Just a point of personal privilege. Actually, I'll be in London on, I think, May 22nd, having a book signing. If you have any friends there, <laughs> email me so I can tell them where to show up. But, um, well, first of all, when you say a Robeson stature, that narrows the question. Yes, it does. Tremendously. Uh, because it's difficult to find someone of that stature. As you, you, I'm sure you know, you mentioned writers, Langston Hughes, of course, Nicholas yeah. Guillen of Cuba, of course, were on the front line. I actually, I talk about that in my book on uh, Cuba. Um, I can't think of, there must have been some others of that stature, but I can't think of them. I can't pull that out of my I memory. I say like thing. movie stars, like yeah. singers. I mean, I can think of people raising Pop money uh, yeah, yeah, in Los yeah, Angeles. That's this is the front. <laughs> <laughs> the front. <laughs> and it's dirty on the front, you know? Mm -hmm. Frida Kahlo went to help some of the refugees. Mm -hmm. That's not going to the front. <laughs> <laughs> well, she could barely walk. She wasn't Betty Davis. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I, I, I bow to your point. I can't think of anyone of, of that Ernest stature. Hemingway. He was a writer. Yeah, which side did he go for? The whole oh. side, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, your point is well taken. Yes. Can you comment a little on, on some of the critics, particularly uh, Missouri Dale Erskine and Jackie Robinson, and why can you really criticize Rosen, particularly after he stood up for both of them uh, in a long struggle? Mm -hmm. Well, Zora Lee Hurston, the writer, was obviously a very eccentric figure. Um, although, in a forthcoming book, I'm quoting her on Hiroshima Nagasaki, and I think she made some of the most sagacious and learned comments about the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki that I've seen anyone make, which, as a matter of fact, she was saying at that time that this was such an outrage that it made her worry that if this were to happen to the Japanese, what does this mean for black Americans? I mean, oftentimes, once again, people are looking at this, like the internment of Japanese Americans, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the land of US domestic racism, which is totally understandable. But as you probably know, Zora Neale Hurston really turns to the right uh, in the 1950s, has a number of personal difficulties and personal troubles. But Jackie Robinson is probably the more apt uh, person to mention in this context. You may recall that in his uh, infamous talk or testimony before the House and American Activities Committee during the height of the Red Scare, this is after Robinson's remarks in Paris, which did not go down very well, on, at least in Washington. Uh, Jackie Robinson rebuked and reprimanded Robinson. In fact, I have an incident in the book where his fellow Brooklyn Dodger, Don Newcomb, I don't know if you recall Don Newcomb, the hulking hurler uh, for the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Dodgers, actually is threatening to you know, kick Robeson's butt <laughs> over his uh, politics. Don Newcomb is still in the land of living, by the way. Yes. Um, but it's interesting, I also talk in the book about how subsequently Jackie Robinson apologizes. And this, is, this happens in the context of Malcolm X castigating Jackie Robinson after Jackie Robinson had rebuked Malcolm X. And so the way Malcolm X retaliated and responded was by reminding folks about what Robinson did to Robeson and to show that he should not be taken seriously and that he did not have credibility. Um, so, yes? Um, quick, quick question on, uh, I'm sorry I missed most of your talk and I love your work. I'm mean, your most prolific author of American history that I know of, um, prolifically anyway. Um, in terms of the, the genocide uh, petition, and I'm thinking both the 1951 and then what Malcolm tries to do circa 6465, which ultimately he pays his life for. Um, I'm curious, do you, uh, I was at a talk at um, Schomburg Center on Monday about a new book that um, one of the people there was, um, I don't know what she said, Community Grad Center um, in Geography, and I forget her name. She's like, oh, uh, what's up my time? Ruthie Gilmore? Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. So, um, she's a contributor. It's about policing the planet. Mm -hmm. It's this new mm -hmm. 
And one of the people presenters there who was a contributor to this volume was, um, I don't know, I forget the name of the organization she's involved in, but she started as a, I think as a high school student um, in this group of eight people from Chicago in light of the Laquan McDonald, I'll call it assassination, basically. And they, they raised the funds grassroots-wise to go to Geneva. Right. And you know about this, present this to the UN. Mm -hmm. So to tie this in, um, and Malcolm's OAAU being, a, or what comes to be the OAAU is sort of an interim step, uh, just with Black Lives Matter that's going on now, um, I don't even know what, what the question I'm getting at is. I get the drift. One last thing with that, is, is it leading, um, is there any prospect for this in regard to build, building a, a multifaceted, interracial, multi-class left, revolutionary left around this issue? Right? In the United States. Yeah, and as it ties to you know taking this to the UN, as Rose said, and Patterson. Well, I mean, with regard to your latter point, there are people who may be in a better position to comment on that, but let me comment on some of the points that you raised, going back chronologically in time. Uh, you may know that earlier this year, there was a team from the United Nations that came to the United States to investigate the question of black people in the United States, and this working group, whose leaders, I believe, were from France and the Philippines, uh, issued a report that, among other things, endorsed the call for reparations for enslavement and, of course, for Jim Crow and all the other transgressions that have been visited upon uh, black people. And, of course, they spoke to the Native American issue as well, the issue of other oppressed nationalities in North America. You may also know that the uh, parents of Michael Brown, the slain youth in Ferguson, Missouri, also went to G Geneva to make a case to the United Nations Human Rights Commission. Um, so this whole idea of appealing to international bodies to gain leverage here, uh, number one, it, it's, it seems to be evolving, it seems to be developing, which is positive, and it builds upon these past efforts, not only Robeson's efforts and Malcolm X's efforts, but an effort I was involved in as a lawyer in the 1970s with the National Conference of Black Lawyers, where we sought to do something similar in terms of going to the United Nations. We always had a very active international presence. Uh, we, I could talk at length about that. Um, and of course, that goes back even before Robeson to the Du Bois NAACP petition to the United Nations, circa 46, 47, a Civil Rights Congress petition around that same time to the United Nations. And even before that, of course, the uh, efforts around Ethiopia in the 1930s, which involved repeated trips by some to the League of Nations and Switzerland in the 1930s. And then before that, the Versailles Peace uh, Congresses uh, settling World War I, uh, circa 1919, which of course is a, also the occasion for a Pan-African Congress. And then of course, speaking of the Pan-African Congresses, their efforts were routinely international, as embodied and exemplified in their name. Now, whether or not this is going to lead, as your latter comment suggested, to what many of us are hoping for, this sort of militant, multiracial organization of the left and radicalism and international ties, well, we'll see. we shall see, as they say on television. Yes. Um, to help the young brother understand what the problem is. And I think seeing this through the movement and hearing about a history of Paul Robeson and others, Hubert Harrison, the problem here in this country has always been, and if you can think of it like if we were on a hippie bus ride in California, it's all right to be on the bus, and sometimes I could sit near the front, but you're not gonna let me hold the wheel and steer, okay? And that is a big problem even in the left forum. They don't let certain voices in because you ask the hard questions. There's a problem I have with the Green Party. I call it the groundhog politics. Every four years, they raise their head up and show up. They never walk in the hood. And I did something. I dared a woman who was running for, a local, for an office in New York to go to the 40 Projects, if you know where that is in Queens. All right? I do. 
right, well. I went. <laughs> and, I said, and I said to her, you go there and you knock on some doors and you do the grassroots work. And, when she, and the next time she came to uh, one of our educational meetings, she said she would never go to the neighborhood again. This is the black woman with the green card. So I have issues with that. As I say to young people, you know, when you're, riding, you're driving a truck, dry, uh, a fuel truck which has a liquid load, which has the heaviest load on brakes, do you pull and you're down and you lose your brakes going down the side of a mountain? Do you pull the emergency brake or you try to kick your wrenches out and fix the truck as it's descending down the mountain? Did I? <laughs> you pull the emergency brake, then you fix it. Pull the emergency brake on the system and then fix the system. Do the grassroots work. Why is everybody running for governor and president instead of city council? I prefer to see 10 Ben Davises in New York than one governor doing nothing or never getting there. Okay? It's a, and when you fight a war with limited ammunition, you gotta, you gotta be a sharpshooter. So you wasting ammunition. I'm, I'm, I'm hard on that. You know, I mean, you know, let, hey, we got limited ammunition. Every round's got to count, headshot, which means you got to, you know, and I mean, basically, headshot by voting the right way, okay? Mm -hmm. So if anybody in here is a counter revolution <laughs> right. and, and rats me out, too late. You, know? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? And speak to the left for them and tell them stop locking out black people. <laughs> because I'm, I'm, as of now, I'm not allowed, I'm a reporter, I'm not allowed in. Speak to Steph mm. for two years, okay? Why? Because I said the same thing in a, in a room. I said, Cynthia McKinney should have ran for, Lepo, for, went to California since she's known in Congress, and ran for Pelosi's seat. Not run for president and never be on the ballot. And mathematically, it's a waste of time. Okay, Jim, well, do you have uh, well, uh, just in conclusion, I'd just like to thank you for inviting me. And, and buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, for your steady hand. Uh, obviously, I'm not disappearing. Come up to buttonhole me if you have any other questions. And thank you very much for your rapt attention. You're going to sign some books?